Good evening, Narad. Namaste, all. Oh, I got to put my headphones on. Sorry. Namaste. Namaste. Um, what what page are we on? Uh, One hundred and nine, I guess, so maybe even ten already. All right, let me check here. So I can close this out and close this out and go to my savage studies. One ten. Okay. Here we are. Okay, and what was the line? Who remembers the line? Maybe 109. I think we still are there at the end somewhere. Okay. So we can start from from the end of 109 only when we have climbed above ourselves. And... Yeah. Okay. Um, now that maybe we could discuss also the shifting of the time. Yes, to... it's a very good. It's a very good idea. Now I do have, I have Sneha at six thirty on Sunday, six thirty p.m. But we could do six. Uh, no, maybe we could we do seven o'clock Indian I time. Cannot, I cannot do it because we have ten o'clock hour <clears throat> the sangha, uh, Sunday sangha of uh, uh, US. I can so, do either nine o'clock our time or or this time. Yeah, nine o'clock US time. Yeah, nine o'clock US time, it will be exactly 6.30 your time. 6.30, yeah, that's when I have her. Well, I'll have to change Sneha then. So let's make it 6.30 okay. next week. Hmm? Yes, and people have to, I will send everybody kind of clarification on this. Oh, very good, okay. All right, so I'll con we'll concentrate a few moments and uh, then we have to get into the next page after that. Yes, I got it. Um, uh, I can't see anybody, but here we are. Okay. Now, um, Betty wrote to me and she asked if, uh, when it was, and I wrote her back immediately. And uh, I don't see her on there. Yeah, this uh, time shifting was confusing. Yeah, yeah. All right, but we'll begin anyway. She's there. Okay. Saying hello to you. You can switch on microphone and say hello. Pardon? Switch on microphone? No, no, I was talking to Betty. Oh, okay. <clears throat> oh, very good. So we'll begin. Only when we have climbed above ourselves, a line of the transcendent meets our road and joins us to the timeless and the true. It brings to us the inevitable word, the godlike act the thoughts that never die all. So, I don't think we've done transcendent or else we did it a long time ago. So I will ask someone in our group who has the lexicon to read the transcendent for us. It's a bit long, but it's very well worth doing because it's something that's very important to Sri Aurobindo's yoga. Who can do that for us?
Hello. Natalie? I'm very hmm? sorry. I'm not at home at the moment, so I don't have ah, Lexi in front of oh, me. I'm okay. sorry. That's okay. Um, uh, Jayashree there? I don't see her there. All right. Abba. Hmm. Okay. I'll read it. A transcendent who is beyond all world and all nature, and yet possesses the world and its nature, who has descended with something of himself into it and is shaping it into that which as yet it is not, is the source of our being. Ah, oh, something happened again. Okay. <clears throat> the source of our works and their master. But the seed of the transcendent consciousness is above in an absoluteness of divine existence. And there too is the absolute power, truth, bliss, of the eternal, of which our mentality can form no conception, and of which even our greatest spiritual experience is only a diminished reflection in the spiritualized mind and heart, a faint shadow, a thin derivate. Yet, proceeding from it, there is a sort of golden corona of light, power, bliss, and truth, a divine consciousness, as the ancient mystics called it, a supermind, a gnosis, with which this world of a lesser consciousness, proceeding by ignorance, is in secret relation and which alone maintains it and prevents it from falling into a dis dis disintegrated chaos. The transcendent, the universal, the individual are three powers overarching, underlying and penetrating the whole manifestation this is the first of the trinities. In the unfolding of consciousness also, there are the three fundamental terms and none of them can be neglected if we would have the experience of the whole truth of existence. And here it is, out of the individual, we wake into a vaster, freer, cosmic consciousness, but out of the universal too, with its complex of forms and powers, we must emerge by a still greater self exceeding into a consciousness without limits that is founded on the absolute, the synthesis of yoga. <clears throat> we see then, that there are three terms of the one existence, transcendent, universal, and individual. And that each of these always contains secretly or overtly the two others. The transcendent possesses itself always and controls the other two as the basis of its own temporal possibilities. That is the divine, the eternal, all-possessing God consciousness, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresence, which informs, embraces, 
governs all existences. The human being is here on earth, the highest power of the third term, the individual. For he alone can work out at its critical turning point that movement of self-manifestation, which appears to us as the involution and evolution of the divine consciousness between the two terms of the ignorance and the knowledge, the life divine. Last night, I had uh, a session with Ramanath from the synthesis of yoga where Sri Aurobindo speaks to us and says there is, there are three basic qualities of this yoga. The yoga of works, the yoga of bhakti, sorry, yoga of knowledge first, the yoga of bhakti, and lastly, the yoga of works. And he says that at one point, they will all be joined together. So knowledge will widen out to embrace bhakti and then widen out even further to embrace karma yoga, which is actually one of the fastest methods of opening the psychic being doing work for the divine, but not egotistically saying that I am doing this work for the divine, but beginning slowly to realize that it is the divine who is working through us and we are only instruments. This is my not only premise, but my avowed position for the own choirs. We are simply instruments receiving the new music from the divine presence. So one more time, the transcendent from Letters on Yoga. This is what is termed the Adya Shakti. She is the supreme consciousness and power above the universe. And it is by her that all the gods are manifested. And even the supramental Ishwara comes into manifestation through her. The supramental Purushottama, of whom the gods are powers and personalities. I read in one of Sri Aurobindo's works, where he says, it is the mother who will bring down the supramental. And indeed in 1956, six years after he allowed his body to be put into the earth, mother broke through and the supramental flooded the earth. So this is very, very important, this passage and what does it do? It joins us to the timeless and the true. And, and what is it that's joining us? It's this line of the transcendent that meets our road, our path, our journey, and joins us to the timeless and the true. Also, it brings to us the inevitable word Inevitable here is, in a very sense, in, in, in a deeper sense, something that is sure to happen or to come. It is certain, it is necessary. And what happens? It brings us a godlike act, the thoughts that never die. Would you like to add something, Vladimir? 
I, I don't think so. No, thank you. Okay. This is so profound what you read on transcendental. It is something really to yes, ponder yes. about. Yes. A ripple of light and glory wraps the brain and traveling down the moment's vanishing road, the figures of eternity arrive. Now, these are the things that happen when we achieve when we when we achieve the godlike act this ripple of light and glory wraps the brain interesting wraps doesn't go into the brain wraps the brain and traveling down the moment's vanishing road, the figures of eternity arrive. As the mind's visitors or the heart's guests, they espouse our mortal brevity a while, or seldom in some rare delivering glimpse are caught by our visions delicate surmise. A few definitions here, I think. First of all, they espouse. What, what does espouse really mean? Well, they adopt, they embrace our mortal brevity a while. They could be the mind's visitors or they could be the heart's guests and they take on themselves this embrace of our mortal brevity a while, or seldom. Now, brevity, of course, is briefness, shortness of time or duration, or seldom in some rare delivering glimpse. Now, here we have two words that are interesting. Delivering. Delivering means to set free or to liberate, to release. So we have this glimpse, this rare glimpse that uh, touches us. It's a delivering glimpse. And a glimpse is a very brief passing look, very brief view or sight, momentary. And what happens then? They are caught by our vision's delicate surmise. Now, surmise is an interesting word here. Sri Aurobindo uses. A surmise is an idea or even a thought of something that seems to be possible or likely. And it can also be, in other terms, an idea that's inferred from some inconclusive evidence, like a guess or a suspicion, or it can be a conception of something or a conjecture. So we continue on. Although beginnings only and first attempts, these glimmerings point to the secret of our birth and the hidden miracle of our destiny. These, although they're only beginnings and they're only first attempts, even though they're glimmerings, that's an intermittent flickering or flashing, they point to the secret of our birth and what else and the hidden miracle of our destiny. So this whole passage leads us to this and now to this important line. Two lines actually. <clears throat> well, it keeps going back and forth, I'm sorry. <clears throat> what we are there and here on earth 
shall be is imaged in a contact and a call. Now, imaged here is a little bit different from what we think of it as being pictured or imagined because it's, uh, it's like mirrored or reflected in a contact and a call. Now, the word contact is also important here because it's the condition of touching or of immediate proximity. Now, <clears throat> I really have to read the call. I don't know if we've done it before, but for me, it has always been one of the most important things in this yoga. Sri Aurobindo begins, all yoga is in its nature, a new birth. It is a birth out of the ordinary, the mentalized material life of man into a higher spiritual consciousness and a greater and diviner being. No yoga can be successfully undertaken and followed unless there is a strong awakening to the necessity of that larger spiritual existence. The soul that is called to this deep and vast inward change may arrive in different ways to the initial departure. It may come to it by its own natural development which has been leading it unconsciously towards the awakening. It may reach it through the influence of a religion or the attraction of a philosophy. It may approach it by a slow illumination or leap to it by a sudden touch or shock. It may be pushed or led to it by the pressure of outward circumstances, or by an inward necessity, by a single word that breaks the seals of the mind, or by long reflection, by the distant example of one who has trod the path, or by contact and daily influence. According to the nature, and the circumstances, the call will come. The synthesis, synthesis of yoga. For me, this is so important, so very important, because this yoga is indeed a new birth. Nothing has ever happened before to compare to the interval yoga. So we know it is a birth out of the ordinary, the, the mentalized material life Sri Aurobindo speaks about, into a higher spiritual consciousness and a greater and diviner being. But it cannot be successfully undertaken, this yoga, or followed, unless we awake to the necessity of a larger spiritual existence. All of us are already at this point. There's no question there. We wouldn't be reading Savitri. We wouldn't be meditating, concentrating. We wouldn't be conscious in some ways of the Divine Mother and Sri Aurobindo. The soul that is called to this deep and vast inward change may arrive in different ways to this beginning, this initial departure. So how can it come? Well, it can come by its own natural development. That is to say, those who have had many, many lives previously have taken rebirth again and again, and the psychic being has come out and is leading them. So it could be by its natural development, but it could be 
that it's been leading it unconsciously also towards the awakening. And then he speaks of different things. A, rel a religion could do it. The attraction of a philosophy could do it. It could come by a slow illumination or leap to it by a sudden touch or shock. Now, you've all heard of someone who falls from a tree and hits his head hard and suddenly has this awakening. Or you meet someone and there's some kind of almost electric experience and, and you're taken, you're taken away from this material life, this mental life. Or the pressures of outward circumstances can lead us to it. We've had enough of the life of the world with its getting and spending as Wordsworth says, laying waste its powers. Or, you know, the material existence, keeping up with the Joneses is a common phrase in America. Or it could be by an inward necessity. It came that way to me. Nothing, nothing meant anything to me, any sense anymore, not religion, not the uh, attraction of friends or books, experiences, but this single word that breaks the seal of the, of the mind was when I met Jyoti Priya and she said one phrase to me, oh, but you are meant to see mother. And that was the word. That was the single word that broke the seals of my mind. And then Sri Aurobindo concludes with, it could be that by the distant example of one who has trod the path, Sri Aurobindo, mother, or by contact and daily influence, mother, and some of the disciples as well. For me, it was Nalini and Aurobindo Basu, but it was also at times others, Purani, um, who treated me like a son and a brother. Uh, it, could, it could have been, you know, so many of those early disciples, Pavitra, for example, who would write to me and send me mother's replies. But then Sri Aurobindo says this very important thing, according to the nature and the circumstances, the call will come. Now, he says the human, and that's the synthesis of yoga. Now here's the letters on yoga. The human vital and physical external nature resist to the very end. My goodness, don't we know that? But if the soul has once heard the call, it arrives sooner or later. Letters on yoga. And I'll do two more from the synthesis again. The call, once decisive, stands. The thing that has been born cannot eventually be stifled. Even if the force of circumstances prevents a regular pursuit or a full practical self-consecration from the first, Still, the mind has taken its bent and persists and returns with an ever-increasing effect upon its leading preoccupation. There is an ineluctable persistence of the inner being, and against it, circumstances are in the end powerless, and no weakness in the nature can for long be an obstacle. And lastly, essays on the Gita. 
The call of God is imperative and cannot be weighed against any other considerations. And I'll close with these three lines. As yet, Earth's imperfection is our sphere. Our nature's glass shows not our real self. That greatness still abides, held back within. Okay, our nature's glass, it's like a looking glass, it's like a mirror, but it's not showing our real self because held back within, that greatness still abides. To abide is to remain somewhere, to reside, to dwell. So it dwells within, held back. This is so beautiful, people. Read it again and again. And these quotes from On the Call and also on the transcendent are great keys in this integral yoga. I pray for all of you and I, I invoke the mother's blessings and Sri Aurobindo's grace to keep you all well and joyously on the path. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste.